Saki. You're watching Live from the Law here at Think Tech Hawaii. We're on Wednesdays between 1 and 1.30, and we're, thank you for joining us. We're with today, um, we're so lucky today to have a good friend and an industrious paralegal at our law firm, Clay Chapman, Iwamura Police in Nervell. Her name is Martha Jane Uran. And we're going to talk a little bit about paralegal stuff and a lot of bit about what you did before you were paralegal, which is fascinating. Okay. Okay. So, um, what, 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 how, did, how did you make the transition? Why did you decide to become a paralegal? It's actually a very cute story. Um, I always knew how to type. And my career in show business was waning down because as a woman gets older, she works less it's in impossible. show business. Yeah. Yes. And so one day a friend of mine called me up and she said, oh, this lawyer over in Santa Monica needs somebody to type. I said, I'm not driving all the way to Santa Monica. It'll take a half an hour. She said, you need the money. I said, oh, all right. Well, it turned out to be this fantastic attorney named Charles R. English, who the Charles R. English Award and the American Bar Association in Criminal Defense is named in his honor. Oh, well, how nice for you. Yes, and we had um, celebrity clients, like when Jack Nicholson took the golf club and bashed somebody's car, that firm represented him. Oh, you must be so proud. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. And so then uh, I had property in Hawaii, and I decided, you know, why is somebody in my condo in Hawaii, and I'm on the freeway stuck here in Los Angeles, so I moved over to Hawaii, and. Uh, very luckily found work as a paralegal right away when I moved here. When was that? 2001, May 15th, 2001. Oh, this, it's a while. Yes, and I worked at another firm before. I worked at uh, Kessner Omobayashi Bain in Matsunaga, doing the same thing, you know, uh, litigation, defense. People should know how, um, how in-demand paralegals are. Are there, are, oh, it's really hard to get a good paralegal, and we're lucky. Martha is very organized, very well. She's very well educated, also. So, if you're contemplating a career in the law and you're not maybe ready to go to law school, you might try it out as a paralegal. Even if you are contemplating going to law school, you should try it out as a paralegal. I think. Yes. Well, what's interesting is that here in Hawaii, we don't require certification for you to call yourself a paralegal. In some states, unless you uh, take very, very uh, intense training and a very, very uh, complicated exam, which people compare to t passing the bar. Really? In some states, you have to call yourself a legal assistant. You cannot use the term paralegal. But here in Hawaii, you can because so, they're not certified. So it's paradise for paralegals here, too. Yes, like I it is so. for everybody else. Yes, yes. So look, what is a para? I have no. I'm a lawyer. I have no idea what does a paralegal do. Y it seems to me you do almost anything a lawyer does. Yes. Well, the, the the law is that you can't give any legal advice to anyone. You do work under the supervision of an attorney. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do is a lot of um, summaries and writing reports. Other paralegals do more of what we call transactional work, mm -hmm. which is they get involved in bankruptcies and filing of documents and stuff, which I, I don't do that kind of That's paralegal That's really work. complicated. It's very complicated. I haven't had training You're for a it. litigation paralegal. Yes. You've always been a litigation yes. paralegal. Yes. And we do what's called insurance defense. For instance, if, um, uh, heaven forbid, somebody has a car accident and the person's car got hit and somebody's suing them, the insurance company will hire an attorney to represent them based upon, you know, what their policy involves. And so a lot of times that's the kind of work that we do. And we have to investigate everything, look at the medical records, make sure that the um, injuries are as claimed. You know, some people try and, and put a stubbed toe into like a million dollar claim. Really? We wow. prevent that. Yeah. <laughs> well, so do you think... Um, the, the field of paralegals is a growing field, or do you think it's a diminished? To me, it seems like it should be a growing field. Well, as long as the, there are more and more lawyers, there's going to be more and more paralegals. Because, for instance, um, it might come as no surprise to you that paralegals make less than lawyers. So a lot of times, especially the insurance companies, want as much of the work done by a paralegal because it costs them less. Right, right. Um, but again, it's always under the supervision of the attorney. Well, the paralegals that I've worked with are just terrific. And, you know, since I'm new to Hawaii and I'm, there's rules I'm not familiar with and courts I'm not familiar with, they've just been invaluable in helping assist me through the, the system. I mean, the law is very similar, but, but the... Uh, 
the structure is not exactly the same as it is in New York. So right. different courts and stuff like that. So. Right, like you can't like just open a phone book and get the phone number of the judge's chamber. You've got to know no. somebody who knows that all important phone number right. if you have to get through to the judge for any reason. Right, right. You know, they Especially in Hawaii, it's really who you know. The more the more people you know, the better off you are. Yes. yes. As you probably have found out over your period here. So, you know, this is my theory. My theory is that litigators particularly, particular, particularly, 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 and trial lawyers absolutely are thwarted actors. Um, I've met so many trial lawyers who wanted to be actors or had gone to acting school, and you actually, it's so exciting, were an actor, were a comedian, nationally known, and you decided to go into the field of law. And is there, is there any connection at all? Uh, in a certain sense, you know, you have to always act like you know what's going on. And um, there have been a couple of attorneys, not at our firm, of course, or the other firm I worked at, but, you know, through the years, a couple of attorneys who really didn't know what they were doing and projected that lack of knowledge. That's not good. That's not good. That it's, doesn't engender confidence no, in your attorney. No, not at all. So I think that there's some sort of bravura or, you know, uh, feelings of grandiose, grandiosity right. or something that right. lends itself to making a person feel comfortable in the legal field. Right, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, sort of, yeah, you, you're, you play a lawyer. I mean, actually, it, that sounds, it's kind of crazy, but you do. My interactions as a lawyer are completely authentic, but different in, in, uh, than my interactions as Marianne Sasaki, you know, personal your friend or, or, you know, tennis partner or whatever. Um, I do put, I suit up. I suit up and I become a lawyer when I walk into the office usually, yeah. You know, or I do it sometimes at home, but mostly when I walk into the office. Yeah, I find that um, it's also good to be here in Hawaii because uh, the standards of dress are not what they are in Los Angeles or New York. For instance, um, I'm very casually dressed at work uh, because I don't usually see clients. If I know I'm going to see a client, I'll make a little extra effort. Right. Um, but usually it's just me and the computer and all of the 9,000 pounds of documents that I'm like p pouring through. And Well, but I feel like um, I'm so used to New York and having worn a suit so, for so many years that I... I kind of feel prepared if I'm dre dressed up. If I'm not... If I'm, when it's casual day, I kind of feel like not, I, I just don't get into the role yeah. as easily. It's a little bit more, I do a lot more filing and a lot more schlumping around the office, you know, that kind of thing. So how, where are you from originally? How did you get into acting? Um, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, I went to Harvard University and I was studying. As did I, we're alma mater. Yeah, but she went to the law school. Yeah, but it's I still went to the Harvard. College. It's yeah. Harvard, Harvard, it's Harvard. Anyway, so. I was studying um, human populations and natural resources, you know, environmental things. And then one day I said, oh, I'm going to take a dance class. I'll get physically fit. It'll be fun. The next thing I know, I'm majoring in modern dance. I'm not doing any other courses. And so all of the dances that I would choreograph, and I did receive a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts for my choreography. Wow. Um, back in the 70s, you know. Uh, and uh, all my dances ended up being funny. And so that sort of like pushed me into doing stand-up comedy. Right, which and takes so much nerve. Take, I think it takes so oh, much nerve. Oh, no. It doesn't take any nerve to do stand-up comedy. It takes a lot to get the bookings. That's the hard part. Is it really hard? Yeah. Yeah, because unless you're at a certain level, you've got to phone up the people and go, hi, any openings in October? You know, right. you have to call months in advance. Right. And, you know, you sort of get into a thing where um, if you know somebody who's well-known, they can recommend you. Um, and then you get to know the, con like I was very uh, good friends with Jay Leno and his wife Mavis, and I've written jokes for Jay Leno, you know, when he was still doing The Tonight Show. You know, you have to be on an approved list. Right, that, yeah, that, because, that I know. Because, you know, just anybody could just sort of like steal somebody else's joke and send right. it in. They have to know that you're the real deal, right. that you wrote the joke. Right, right, right. So, so you began touring around the country when you yeah, did Yeah, I that? toured all over the United States, so Canada. Um, even Mexico, like the resorts had comedians. I was on in the West End of London. They had a club there for a while. And I was very popular in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> really? Yes. You know why? Or just uh, I, They had so many Americans there, because I guess for the offshore banking and whatever. 
Although there, if you go there, there's no actual banks. It's a post office. No, box. yeah. Even the law firms there. We they, we always would joke that it's great to be a Cayman Islands lawyer because you spend your whole day on the golf course because it's just a, really a mailing address. That's yeah, true. You just true. you know issue an opinion every now and then and and avoid subpoenas. It. Yeah, it's just it's it's like it's it's almost it's better than here. It's almost more you because you're insulated a little bit. So was it? So this was in the '80s. So was it difficult as a woman to? Um, yes. Yes. Again. Yeah. They they would. Uh, there were different standards for women and for men. Like guys could basically get up and tell all kinds of jokes, especially if it was a club where you know there was no censorship. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the same club, you know, women would come in, and half the time the manager would say, "No, don't talk about this. Don't talk about that." You mean that. you can't be disgusting if you're a woman? That's not, not when that. I. Was, no. Now Amy Schumer has blazed a trail for a lot of women in comedy, but in those days, you know, it just wasn't done. And then Roseanne came along and was like a big tough guy in a dress. Right. 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 Um, so uh, such a powerhouse. That's so interesting that the owners would think that they could censor what um, your material. I mean. Well, they have it now um, that they have uh, a, a whole uh, bunch of comics that go to churches and they do what they call clean comedy. You know, there's no, there's no swearing as you would find in a normal comedy right, club. Right. But even here, they have uh, a lot of comedy on the military uh, basis and for military personnel here. And it's very serious. They don't want any swearing. You know, they, they have a certain standard that has to be upheld. And if you break the rules, you don't come back. Well, that's, well, you know, this, this is kind of an interesting topic because Bill Maris won't play college campuses anymore because they're too politically correct, and so he has to guard what he says. Have you, do you have any opinion on, the, on like, the in increasing political correctness of society and the difficulty of being a comedian in that society? I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. Uh, I think that there are, you know, there's the... There's a reason why some comedy is on HBO and is uncensored, and some is on, you know, NBC and is not censored. Although you find that if you watch somebody that's on Seth Meyers at late night, it'll be a little bit more raunchy like than a, than the stuff yeah, that was like earlier. It's little little by little gradations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there are a lot of comics that started out as lawyers. That's right. Well, we'll, we'll have to talk about those when we come back. You're watching Life in the Law with Marianne Sasaki and Martha Jane Uran. Yes. And we'll be right back after a few moments. Aloha. My name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We highlight businesses and individuals that are successful in Hawaii, and we learn their secrets to their success. I hope you can join us and listen in because we always have a pack of information on successful stories in Hawaii. Aloha. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider, and we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock, and we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, offering lifelong learning from passionate hosts and fascinating guests ready to explore and explain Hawaii's place in the 21st century. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, I'm Marian Sasaki. You're watching Life in the Law and Think Tech. Uh, we're talking to Martha J. Uran about what lawyers that became comics. So can, who are the, uh, is there anybody I would know? Um, I think um, maybe Brad Garrett was one of them. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Uh, they just, as a, you, you, know, you were talking about like the, the uh, ability to perform, lawyers have an ability to perform and sometimes, you know, they, they take it another step. And right. Well, I, you know, I can, I, you know, it, going to law school is it's such an eye opener. I can definitely say, I know somebody who became an actor instead of going to law school, and because it was, they really were really. I mean, it's really hard and really miserable. And and if you and if you don't love it or you don't want to love it or you don't think you can use it, it's you, you're better off doing you know something you love like comedy or acting or something like that. So, so tell me about um, your like TV shows, the TV shows you were on. 
Did um, you have a type? Uh, 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 sitcoms. Okay. I was in a sitcom called Lenny, okay. which was a CBS primetime show, and it starred Lenny Clark, who was a well-known comedian from Boston, and um, I played the obnoxious neighbor, <laughs> and I had to do it in a Boston accent, which was easy for me to do because I'm from there. Right. I played Mrs. Margaret Luby. <laughs> was it on for a while? A year. Oh, that's not and bad. And then um, uh, it happened that it was during the, the first Gulf War, and, and when the show was on was when the Scud missiles were attacking, and so the ratings were low. <laughs> oh, well, that's too bad. You know, it's heartbreaking. You know, I know people work so hard and they make pilots, and the pilots don't get picked up. And stuff oh, I did like a few that. pilots that didn't get picked up, and you know, you never know. I think that's heartbreaking. I mean, Especially if you go out and buy a new car and then you got to pay for well, it. Well, yeah, you which I did. <laughs> you shouldn't. You shouldn't count your chickens before they hatch. So, um, so tell. So, so what? So how? What what was it like as a woman in the eighties? You know, go was it was there was there a casting couch or no what no 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 no. Um, well, maybe there was, but I was never invited <laughs> yeah. onto it. It's like um, me. I say I I can I, I can never make a, a, a living off my body. Everybody always wanted my mind. Instead, <laughs> when I was a kid, I was like oh, I can always make a living off my body. No, they want. Oh, I, I had a joke. I used to do a, a trailer park character in my act. And her favorite song was, he may be on my body, but it's you that's on my mind. <laughs> that's funny. So, um, now what, what happened when I started comedy was so different now. Like if you read Amy Schumer's book, and I think she's a great comic, uh, the comics now have to go out and literally provide the audience for the club. Uh, you know, wow, that's hard. Uh, very hard. But when I did it, on Monday night, and this is in Los Angeles, on Monday night you went to the comedy store. On Tuesday night you went to the Laugh Stop in Encino. And on Wednesday night it was uh, another place down in Newport Beach. And then on Thursday night you went to the Ice House in Pasadena. But comedy was so popular. I mean, I used to go to comedy shows. I, I haven't been to a comedy show in probably 25 or 30 years, but you know, I remember when I was growing up, there were comedy clubs all over the place. Everybody went. So what do you think happened? Well, I think there was a pro proliferation of comedians. Like when I did it, you know, it was very easy to get work, you know, once you were known because they knew you would do a good job and that, you know, uh, things were okay. I will tell you about the time I got fired. Which, oh, okay. All right, I went to this club. It was in uh, Binghamton, New York. And I, the weeks usually went like Tuesday through Sunday. So Tuesday night, I thought the show had gone really, really well. And then Wednesday morning, I get a call in my hotel room, the Holiday Inn, and it's the manager of the club. And she said, we need you to come over. And I went, oh, maybe I have to do some publicity or something. Right. So I get there, and she's got cash on her desk, and she says, we're going to pay you for the whole week, but, you know, we're, we don't need you. Really? I said, you mean I'm fired? She said, yes, I, and I was so hurt. I said, well, what's wrong? She said, well, nothing's wrong with you, except you look too much like the boss's ex-wife, and he can't stand the sight of That's you. That's hilarious. True story. I True that story. That is hilarious. Well, at least you got paid for the week. I thought then it for gets sure I wouldn't pay you. Then it gets better. <coughs> I get in my car, and I go down, and all the comedians in New York used to hang out in front of the improv, or in the improv, you know, mm -hmm. at the, the little lounge there. And um, one of the comedians who had a drinking problem had gone on a binge and so they called up the club to see if anybody was available for the rest of the week to go and fill in for the comedian that was on the binge. So I worked there. I got paid twice that week. Oh, that's terrific. Not always did those things happen. No, because, I mean, I, I, my uh, little knowledge of, like, uh, I had some knowledge with, like, rock and roll shows and that kind of thing. And it was always get the money, get the money first, because if you don't get the money first, you can never be sure. Oh, yeah, don't take get a the check money. from a nightclub owner. No, right. No, definitely not. So... What would you tell some uh, a young woman? Like, how, what would you advise people who wanted to do comedy now? I mean, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Because I think you have to have like a, I think you have to be famous before you get famous. I mean, people are plucked from YouTube all the time. And I think YouTube would be a good way to go because you know you're out there. You're responsible for your material. I think a lot of people have trouble writing material, and they have these schools to teach people how to do comedy and. Uh, you know, um, I, I think it's better if you just do it on your own rather than right. try and uh, submit to a formula. Right, right. Well, you know, the thing is, you're so educated. You're educated. F you know, I mean, I think 
what's behind good comedy is intelligence, and behind good paralegals are also intelligence. And I, I wonder, do you ever feel overly qualified as a paralegal? Like, I have had this glamorous field, and, y you know. The, the hardest thing for me as a paralegal is the legal sites. You know, like, uh, you know, Hawaii 30, 1982. Citations. D, yeah. Uh, because I, I, I was never trained to do that. That's a whole separate field and requires a, a, a very immense knowledge. So I have to rely on assistance from either the attorney I'm working for or one of the associate attorneys. But there are lacks, I think, in Hawaii about citations. I, somebody told me that. I don't know. I, I was a, on a journal in law school, so I learned how to blue book, and I do it the same every time. And nobody's ever said anything, so I'm assuming it's, it's probably okay. But I know that they're not, at least in the state courts, they're not tremendous sticklers for, you know, parallel citations and, and you know, jump citations and things like that. So, so who, so people in the office help you with, with yes, the sites? Yes, yes, yes. And do you know how to use Lexis? Um, vaguely. Um, I find, uh, as you know, one of our colleagues, uh, David uh, Mezzamia, right. has shown me how to access uh, reference materials through the Bar Association. And I find that that's a little bit easier and also less costly to the law firm right, to, right. to be able to be assisted by the bar. Um, David was a paralegal and he became a lawyer. I can't imagine. He teaches paralegal now at the university. Right, right. Which, by the way, KCC it is? KCC? Yes, yes. It's a terrific uh, university for paralegals. It's, 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 I think, world regarded. It's widely known. Uh, yes, it's renowned. Yes. And um, several of paralegals in our office, Laurel, have degree, I guess, certificates from there. Yeah, and, a, yeah, and they have to take a test. I think it's called PACE, P-A-C-E. Right, and right. They're, and they're entitled to write that after their name. But do you think that, do you, do you think, you don't, you don't really need, do you need that? Do you need to go to paralegal school, do you think? But for certain transactional things, yes, you do. Right. I mean, I wouldn't know the first thing about helping somebody go through a bankruptcy. I don't know anything about it. Right. I don't know about uh, registering deeds other than my own condo. Right, you know, right. Uh, these are things that definitely need to be taught by somebody who knows what they're doing. Right. Um, but see, so there's room for all sorts of people in the paralegal field. Um, people who, are, you know, like I uh, know that the format for a certain report, like an insurance company doesn't want to report on the case and how it's going, the background, what happened, what are the issues. So I can do that sort of thing. Um, and I'm good at that. I have a, a facility for um, remembering certain stupid things. Why, I don't know. It's trivia, but I, Right, you know. right, right. Well, I think, you know, and I'm not saying you're older. I'm putting me and myself in the same category. I, you know, I think this, um, you know, Twitter universe and these short paragraphs and these blogs, I, I mean, I think it really affects your memory. I think that, you know, having had, had to, I mean, when I was a kid, you have to, concentrate you have to memorize poems for example and memorize things and it was much more uh, you know an athletic workout I think for the mind than now it's really everything is in short bites and it, it, it's kind of distract I think it's yeah, kind of distracting. I, I have never twitted. Yeah um, I don't do it. I, I don't uh, even like texting I think it's like if you want to call me pick up the phone right. you can talk to me right. I'll answer the phone. But everybody under 30 is, is completely But I opposite. see all these people like practically getting killed walking across the crosswalk. I know. You know, texting and, 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 and entering things. They're not looking around. Somebody's going to get hurt. But don't you think... We'll have to take the case. A law firm... Law firm should be technologically savvy, though, I think. A modern law firm is a, a, a technologically savvy law firm, I think. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you've got to have people who know how to do these things. You know, it's like when computers first popped on the scene, you know, and everybody went from selectric typewriters to first it was like the, the DOS system in computers and then, you know, everything that we have now. First, we, all the lawyers wanted word perfect. Now they're all in word. Right, right, right. Um, you know, you have to sort of keep up with what's going on. So let me ask you a question. The preponderance of uh, people in, in, in paralegal that are practicing paralegals are women, right? Yes. Do you think that depresses the salary? Do you think if, it, if there were more men in the field, the salary would be greater? Because I think the salaries should be bet more, higher. Because they, cause they, they really are kind of like quasi, you know, they do a lot, a lot of work that attorneys do. You know? Yeah, I think that um, I, knowing some of the paralegals who are male, 
I don't think they make any more money than the female paralegals. I, I think... Um, but I mean, I, the fact that there are so many women in the profession itself depresses the profession. You know what I mean? Nah. You don't think so? I don't know. I, I, you know, like nursing historically didn't pay well and teaching in these fields that women entered. But I'm, you know, I see, I see, <laughs> I'm such a feminist. I see, I see discrimination lurking around every corner. Well, you know, I went to um, Harvard and when I was there, it's when Harvard and Mad Radcliffe merged, and we always used to joke we married them for their money, <laughs> because the scholarship money available to a Radcliffe student was like zip compared to the scholarship money available to men at Harvard, because when women graduated from Harvard, they didn't usually make a lot of money, right, whereas men right. would go into business and right. have a lot of money to leave the school. I was just reading an article in today's New York Times that was fascinating about the dearth of women billionaires. Apparently, there's a t the, the number of billionaires that are women are tiny. It's infinitesimal fraction compared to how many men. And obviously, I po post that on my Facebook page because, you know, women have to learn how to deal with money um, in a, a aggressive, hard-headed way and not, not shy away from dealing with money, you know, and ask for what they're worth. This is like, you know, big, one of my big, you know, issues, the leaning in kind of thing, you know. So I thought it was pretty interesting. But that would make sense that women who graduated from Radcliffe in the 70s, it would have been, right? Yeah, it was well, in the Well, yeah, 70s, they wouldn't, yeah. They, they were just fighting their way into, into the corporate world to get, you know, to get jobs. Or they'd marry a guy from Harvard. <laughs> It happened. Get an MS or MRS degree. I just, um, before we go, I, I'd just like to say um, I'm a member of the Hawaii Women Lawyers, and we have a luncheon series every month, and we email women lawyers to come and attend, and they're great speakers, and I urge everybody out there to come and attend. I promised the women lawyers I would mention this on, on my show today. Hopefully, we'll be able to get some of uh, the guests on here as well. But, and you should come too, even though it's women lawyers, I think they accept anybody. It's, it's just kind of great. Depends on whether or not you're charging them to get in and they'll take anyone. They'll take, right, exactly, exactly. But thank you so much for joining oh, us today. Oh, thank you for asking me. It was so, uh, it, it's such, it's always so fascinating to find people's, you know, stories and how they make their way. And yeah, so thank you for a fascinating show. You're very good.